Good morning and welcome to the Salvation Army at Wickford. We're so pleased that you could join with us on this Sunday, Easter Sunday, Christ the Lord is risen. What a great day to celebrate the heart of the Christian gospel, that not only has Jesus given his life to rescue the world, but God has shown the, the value, God has shown how this has actually worked, the plan has worked, because he has raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible describes Jesus as the first fruits of, of those being raised from the dead to new life and says that all those who follow him will follow. So you and I have a future in heaven for sure because of this great Easter day. I'm going to pick up the reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through to verse 15. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this is the story that has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Thank you.
So I want us to go to the crime scene, the tomb in the garden. The city is Jerusalem. The date is around the year 30 AD. Who decided that the tomb of Jesus was a crime scene? Well, the answer was found in our Bible reading. The chief priests did. They gave the guards who were at the tomb money and this instruction. We just read it. You are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him, Jesus, away while we were asleep. So the chief priests turned the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday morning into a whodunit. And so today, let us start by thinking about the question, where was the body? We know that it was in a tomb, in a garden, near the place of crucifixion. The tomb was a new one owned by Joseph of Arimathea. John, in his Gospel of Jesus, his account of the life of Jesus, chapter 19, from verses 38 to 43, says this. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, some critics have disputed this and said that the Romans would never have let relatives and friends take away the body of an executed, crucified criminal. They say that victims were simply not allowed formal or regular or individual or private burials. But I'm sorry, archaeology has shown that to be wrong. Let me take you to Cambridgeshire, to the little town of Fenstanton in the year 2017, six years ago. A house building company is, has got plans to build a new housing estate and is having archaeological work done on the site before um, building work continues. The archaeologists find a Roman cemetery and in one, indiv one individual grave, a single individual grave, they find a victim of crucifixion. The smoking gun is the existence of a nail still piercing the heel bone of the victim. That is only the second discovery of a victim of crucifixion anywhere in the world. But the first discovery came in Jerusalem in the year 1968. And that discovery, too, was in a private tomb. So, victims of crucifixion were allowed to be buried in private tombs, private graves, when families claimed the body. So, if this is a crime scene, which the chief priests have turned it into, who are the suspects? Well, it's not going to be the Romans. It's not going to be the, the chief priests. They were in cahoots working on this together. They did everything they could to make the, the scene secure. They made sure there was a huge stone that, that took more than one person to, to move, which would not only have been wedged in front of the tomb, there would have been a bulge in the back to, to sit nicely into the hole, a bit like a, a cork in a bottle. This was really pushed in and, and stopped in. They would have put a rope around it also tying this into place and they would have put a seal on the rope and if you tried to move the rope the seal would have been broken and they put soldiers guarding it. They were not interested in losing this body so, so we can rule the Romans and the, the, the Jewish authorities out of this. What about the women? Well hardly. Um, Mark tells us that even as they were on their way to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning asking each other the crucial question who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? They had no idea. Even as they are going to anoint the body, they haven't thought their plans through. How are they going to anoint the body when they can't get into the tomb? So what about the disciples? Hardly. They are completely demoralised. And you really can't put it stronger than that. Peter had denied that he even knew Jesus on Monday, Thursday evening. Um, he was probably staying in Jerusalem in John's house, John the Apostle's house. John had his hands full with looking after Mary, the mother of Jesus. John was probably frantic with worry about the nine disciples who'd fled in the other direction away from Jerusalem. They were probably staying in, in Bethany. What was going on there? 
Um, as the, the sun dawns on the first day of the week, the, the Sunday, uh, it's probably running through, through John's mind. Should, should he try and get a message through to the other disciples? That they were all just totally demoralised. They'd not understood Jesus um, saying that he was even going to die until the very last minute when um, he was being led out to crucifixion. That, that they had denied all through the earthly ministry of Jesus that this would ever happen. So not only were they in denial of, of the death, that they hadn't even grasped what Jesus had been teaching them about his resurrection. So, so there are no suspects. Um, so, so let's just try a different line of inquiry. Um, let, let's just think of the available evidence. Uh, evidence is, of course, important for any policeman, for any armchair sleuth. So the chief priests had been told by Pilate to make the tomb as secure as they could. And that was why the, the stone had been put there, the rope had been put there, the seal had been put there. We've just heard the Easter hymn where Charles Wesley says, vain the stone, the watch, the, the seal. None of this worked. Uh, the, the way that Matthew tells the story gives us the impression that the entrance to the tomb is actually opened as the women are actually walking to the tomb. The two events happen at the same time. The women are walking to the tomb and the tomb is opened. Matthew told us that in the Bible reading that, that we had right at the beginning, he said there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And the angel then immediately invites the women to, into the tomb to see the place where the body of Jesus had been placed just two days earlier. And the point we, we need to grasp here is that the stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. Jesus, or, or, Jesus had already gone. Jesus was not there. The stone was rolled away to let the women and then the disciples in so that they could see that it was an empty tomb and believe that Jesus was risen. So should we be fingerprinting the angel um, aided and abetted by the earthquake? Well, I don't think angels have, uh, have fingerprints, um, but we're getting close to it. So who did this miracle? In writing his biography, his gospel about Jesus, Luke tells us what happened when Jesus was driving, driving a demon out of a man. This demon was causing the man all sorts of distress. And so Jesus exorcises this demon. And some of the bystanders said that Jesus could only do that because Jesus was in league with the devil. And it actually prompts Jesus to tell a fascinating parable. We haven't got time to go into the parable. But Jesus makes an astonishing statement. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see, God's fingerprints are all over the life of Jesus. God's fingerprints are all over the resurrection. The finger of God, or we could say the power of God, is all over everything that happened in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. The finger of God is the confirmation of God's new covenant for his people, the New Testament, the new agreement between God and man, the new plan to rescue man back to his rightful place as part of God's family. The agreement by which we are restored into relationship with God. The old agreement was also made by the finger of God when God wrote on tablets of, tablets of stone for Moses on Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments for the children of Israel to follow. Rules for them to live by if they were going to stay linked with God. That was the old agreement, the Old Testament, the old statement written by the finger of God. And now the finger of God gives us the resurrection of Jesus. With integrity as Christians, we can absolutely trust the accounts of the resurrection of Jesus we find in Scripture. In fact, it is extremely hard to find holes in the resurrection. People have been picking away at this story for thousands of years without managing to disprove it. And I could tell you many stories of people who have failed. I want to tell you just one about Albert Henry Ross. He was born in 1881. He worked in advertising and he was so sceptical that the miracles attributed to Jesus, including the resurrection, um, he was so sceptical that they'd ever happened that he promised himself one day he would write a book 
to, to disprove it. He was inspired by some German theologians in the 19th century who had this search to get at the, the so-called real Jesus and the so-called true story of what happened. Well, Albert Henry Ross eventually applied himself to the task. By that time, he was into his 40s and he ended up writing a very different book from what he intended. He intended to disprove the resurrection and he wrote a book that said, hey, the resurrection happened. Hey, I've looked at the evidence and this is undoubtedly the truth. And he published his book in 1930. At the time in 1930, you had Agatha Christie and a whole wealth of people writing whodunit novels. They were very popular. And so writing under a pseudonym, the pseudonym of Frank Morrison, he captured the public's attention with his book's title, Who Moved the Stone? Nearly 100 years old now, the book has hardly ever been out of print. He wasn't the first and he will not be the last to set off trying to disprove the resurrection and ending up as a believer. If you go into a Christian bookshop, you'll find books by a man called Lee Strobel, who was a very high profile um, journalist, American journalist, who set out to write a book to disprove the resurrection and has been writing books about the truth of the gospel story ever since. Now, the earliest evidence for the resurrection was written down before even the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They start to be written down around about the year 60, 61, 62 AD and in the next 40 years. But 10 years before the earliest, in around about 53 AD, St Paul writes a letter from Ephesus to the church in Corinth. 13 of Paul's letters are contained in the, um, the New Testament today, the, the, the new part of the Bible, 13 of them there. And um, six of those letters are, are, um, are found in a manuscript dating from about 200 AD, about 170 years after, after the, the, the death of, of Jesus. That's very, very early for an ancient manuscript to be connected with a historic event. We are all taught at school, for example, about um, Julius Caesar coming to invade uh, England, I think the year 43 BC, um, and, and we're all taught that, and the earliest manuscript for that is about 900 years after the event. So we have this very, very trustworthy manuscript from Paul writing within about 20 years of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8, Paul says this, I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later, as written in the scriptures. Then he appeared to Peter and then to all 12 the apostle, of the apostles. Then he appeared to more than 500 of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James and afterwards to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared also to me, even though I am like someone whose birth was abnormal. And you might be interested to just realise Paul is not just recording this because it is an interesting historical fact. It's a fact ab about what actually happened on that first Easter. He's recording it because of the encouragement it has for us today. What does this mean for us today? He goes on in the same chapter, verses Chapter 15, 1 Corinthians, verses 20 to 22. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Because you and I trust in Jesus, you and I will be made alive. We are also promised resurrection in our lives. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in those mansions sublime. And this, in a nutshell, is the good news of Easter. We have a future. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. God's fingerprints are all over the resurrection. 
Because he raised Jesus from the dead, you and I know our future. It is promised. It is a future with him in heaven. And so we rejoice that because of Jesus now, because of Jesus, new life is available. New life is available to you. New life is available to me. New life is available to all those who put Jesus at the centre of their lives. Because of Easter, we can celebrate every day of the year. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you because Jesus gave his life for us on Good Friday and because you raised him from death, you raised him from the tomb to show that everything that he had done to rescue us had been successful, to show that we do have a place with you in heaven, to show that we are restored to our place in your family and to show that one day we will be eternally in your presence. We thank you for this promise. We thank you for this special Easter day. We thank you that you are always there for us because of Jesus. Amen. Oh!